Hello everyone, my name is Dennis English, and I'm going to do a reading of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, Chapter 2, The Obligation to Endure. The history of life on Earth has been a history of interaction between living things and their surroundings. To a large extent, the physical form and the habits of the Earth's vegetation and its animal life have been molded by the environment. Considering the whole span of earthly time, the opposite effect in which life actually modifies its surroundings has been relatively slight. Only within the moment of time represented by the present century as one species, man, acquired significant power to alter the nature of his world. During the past quarter century, this power has not only increased to one of disturbing magnitude, but it has changed in character. The most alarming of all man's assaults upon the environment is the contamination of air, earth, rivers, and sea with dangerous and even lethal materials. This pollution is for the most part irrecoverable. The chain of evil it initiates not only in the world that must support life but in living tissues is, a, is for the most part irreversible. In this now universal contamination of the environment, chemicals are the sinister and little recognized partners of radiation in changing the very nature of the world, the very nature of its life. Strontium-90, released through nuclear explosions in the air, comes to Earth in rain or drifts down as fallout, lodges in soil, enters into the grass or corn or wheat grown there, and in time takes up its abode in the bones of a human being, there to remain until his death. Similarly, chemicals sprayed on crop lands or forests or gardens lie long in soil, entering into living organisms, passing from one to another in a chain of poisoning and death. Or they pass mysteriously by underground streams until they emerge and through the alchemy of air and sunlight combine into new forms that kill vegetation, sicking cattle, and work unknown harm on those who drink from once pure wells. As Albert Schweitzer has said, man can hardly even recognize the devils of his own creation. It took hundreds of millions of years to produce the life that now inhabits the earth, eons of time in which that developing and evolving and diversifying life reached a state of adjustment and balance with its surroundings. The environment rigorously shaped and directing the life it supported contained elements that were hostile as well as supporting. Certain rocks gave out dangerous radiation, even with the light of the sun, from which all life draws its energy. There were shortwave radiation with power to injure. Given time, time not in years but in millennia, life adjusts and a balance has been reached. For time is the essential ingredient, but in a modern world, there is no time. 
the rapidity of change and the speed with which new situations are created follow the impetus and heedless pace of man rather than the deliberate pace of nature. Radiation is no longer merely the background radiation of rocks, the bombardment of cosmic rays, the ultraviolet of the sun which has existed before there was any life on earth. Radiation is now the unnatural creation of man's tampering with the atom. The chemicals to which life is asked to make its adjustments are no longer merely the calcium and silica and copper and all the rest of the minerals washed out of the rocks and carried in rivers to the sea. They are the synthetic creations of man's inventive mind, brewed in his laboratories and having no counterparts in nature. To adjust to these chemicals would require time on a scale that is nature's. It would require not merely the years of a man's life, but the life of generations. And even this, were it by some miracle possible, would be futile, for the new chemicals come from our laboratories in an endless stream. Almost 500 annually find their way into actual use in the United States alone. The figure is staggering and its implications are not easily grasped. 500 new chemicals to which the bodies of men and animals are required somehow to adapt each year. Chemicals totally outside the limits of biological experience. Among them are many that are used in man's war against nature. Since the mid-1940s, over 200 basic chemicals have been created for use in killing insects, weeds, rodents, and other organisms, described in the modern vernacular as pests. And they are sold under several thousand different brand names. These sprays, dusts, and aerosols are now applied almost universally to farms, gardens, forests, and homes, non-selective chemicals that have the power to kill every insect, the good and the bad, to steal the song of birds and the leaping of fish in the streams, to coat the leaves with a deadly film, and to linger on in soil. All this throw the intended target may be only a few weeds or insects. Can anyone believe it is possible to lay down such a barrage of poisons on the surface of the earth without making it unfit for all life? They should not be called insecticides. They should be called biocides. The whole process of spraying seems caught up in an endless spiral. Since DDT was released for civilian use, a process of escalation has been going on which ever more toxic materials must be found. This has happened because insects, in a triumphant vindication of Darwin's principle of the survival of the fittest, have evolved super races immune to the particular insecticide used. Hence, a deadlier one has always to be developed. And then you have to develop a deadlier one than that. It has happened to be because for reasons to be described later destructive insects often undergo a flareback or resurgence after spraying in numbers greater than before thus the chemical war is never won and all life is caught in its violent crossfire. 
Along with the possibility of the extinction of mankind by nuclear war, the central problem of our age has therefore become the contamination of man's total environment with such substances of incredible potential for harm. Substances that accumulate in the tissues of plants and animals and even penetrate the germ cells to shatter or alter the very material of heredity upon which the shape of the future depends. Some would be architects of our future look towards a time when it would be possible to alter the human germ plasm by design. But we may easily be doing so now by inadvertence. For many chemicals, like radiation, bring about gene mutations. It is ironic to think that man might determine his own future by something so seemingly trivial as a choice of an insect spray. All this has been risked for what? Future historians may well be amazed by a distorted sense of proportion. How could intelligent beings seek to control a few unwanted species by a method that contaminated the entire environment and brought the threat of disease and death even to their own kind? Yet, this is precisely what we have done. We have done it, moreover, for reasons that collapse the moment we examine them. We are told that the enormous and expanding use of pesticides is necessary to maintain farm production. Our farms, despite measures to remove acreage from production and to pay farmers not to produce, have yielded such a staggering excess of crops that the American taxpayer in 1962 is paying out more than one billion dollars a year as the total carrying costs of the surplus food storage program. And is the situation helped when one branch of the agriculture department tries to reduce production while in other states as it did in 1958. It is believed generally that reduction of crop acreages under provisions of the soil bank will stimulate interests in use of chemicals to obtain maximum production on the land retained in crops. All this is not to say that there is no insect problem and no need to control. I'm saying, rather, that control must be geared to realities, not to mythical situations. And that the methods employed must be such that they do not destroy us along with the insects. problem whose attempted solution has brought such a train of disaster in its wake is an accompaniment of our modern way of life. Long before the age of man, insects inhabited the earth, a group of extraordinary varied and adaptable beings. Over the course of time since man's advent, a small percentage the more than half a million species of insects had come into conflict with human welfare in two principal ways, as competitors for the food supply and as carriers of human disease. Disease-carrying insects become important where human beings are crowded together especially under conditions where sanitation is poor, as in the time of natural disaster or war, or in situations of extreme poverty and deprivation. When control of some sort becomes necessary, 
It is a sobering fact, however, as we shall presently see, that the method of massive chemical control has only limited access, actually limited success, and also threatens to worsen the very conditions it intends to curb. Under primitive agricultural conditions, the farmer had few insect problems. These arose from the intensification of agriculture, the devotion of immense acreages to a single crop. Such a system set the stage for explosive increases in specific insect populations. Single crop farming does not take advantage of the principles by which nature works. It is agriculture as an engineer might conceive it to be. Nature has introduced great variety into the landscape, but man has displayed a passion for simplifying it. Thus, he undoes the built-in checks and balances by which nature holds the species within bounds. One important natural check is a limit on the amount of suitable habitat for each species. Obviously then, an insect that lives on wheat can build up its population to much higher levels on a farm devoted to wheat than one in which wheat is intermingled with other crops to which the insect is not adapted. The same thing happens in other situations. A generation or more ago, the towns of large areas of the United States lined their streets with the noble elm tree. Now the beauty they hopefully created is threatened with complete destruction as disease through the elms uh, carried by a beetle that would have only limited chance to build up large populations and to spread from tree to tree if the elms were only occasional trees in a richly diversified planting. Another factor in the modern insect problem is one that must be viewed against the background of geologic and human history. The spreading of thousands of different kinds of organisms from their native homes to invade new territories. This worldwide migration has been studied and graphically described by the British ecologist Charles Elton in his recent book, The Ecology of Invasions. During the Creatius period, some hundred million years ago, flooding seas cut many land bridges between continents and living things found themselves confined in what Elton calls colossal separate nature reserves. There, isolated from others of their kind, they developed many new species. When some of the land masses were joined again about 15 million years ago, these species began to move out into new territories, a movement that is not only still in progress, but is now receiving considerable assistance from man. The importation of plants is the primary agent in the modern spread of species. For animals have almost invariably gone along with the plants. Quarantine being a comparatively recent and not completely effective innovation, the United States Office of Plant Introduction alone has introduced almost 200,000 species and varieties of plants from all over the world. Nearly half of the 180 or so major insects enemies of plants in the United States are accidental imports from abroad, and most of them have come as hitchhikers on plants. In new territory, 
out of reach of the restraining hand of the natural enemies that kept down its numbers in its native land, an invading plant or animal is able to become enormously abundant. Thus, it is no incident, or actually accident, that our most troublesome insects are introduced species. These invasions, both the natural occurring and those dependent on human assistance, are likely to continue indefinitely. Quarantine and massive chemical campaigns are only extremely expensive ways of buying time. We are faced, according to Dr. Elton, with a life and death need not just to find new technological means of suppressing this plant or that animal. Instead, we need the basic knowledge of animal populations and their relation to their surroundings that will, quote, promote an even balance and damp down the explosive power of outbreaks and new invasions. Much of the necessary knowledge is now available, but we do not use it. We train ecologists in our universities and even employ them in governmental agencies, but we seldom take their advice. We allow the chemical death brain to fall as though there were no alternatives, whereas, in fact, there are many. Our ingenuity could soon discover many more if given opportunity. We have fallen into a mesmerized state that makes us accept as inevitable that which is inferior or detrimental, as though having lost the will or the vision to demand that which is good. Such thinking, in the words of the ecologist Paul Shepard, quote, idealizes life with only its head out of water, inches above the limits of toleration of the corruption of its own environment. Why should we tolerate a diet of weak poisons, a home in insipid surroundings, a circle of acquaintances that are not quite our enemies, the noise of motors that just enough to relieve, to present, prevent insanity? Who will want to live in a world which is just not quite fatal? Yet such a world is pressed upon us. The crusade to create a chemically sterile, insect-free world seems to have enchanted a fanatic zeal on a part of many specialists, and most of the so-called control agencies. On every hand, there is evidence that those engaged in spraying operations exercise a ruthless power. The regulatory entomologists function as the prosecutor, judge and jury, tax assessor and collector, and sheriff to enforce their own orders, as said by Connecticut entomologist Neely Turner. The most flagrant abuses go unchecked in both state and federal agencies. It is not my contention that chemical insecticides must never be used. I do contend that we have put poisonous and biologically potent chemicals indiscriminately into the hands of persons largely or wholly ignorant of their potentials for harm. We have subjected enormous numbers of people to contact with these poisons without their consent and often without their knowledge.
If the Bill of Rights contains no guarantee that a citizen shall be secured against lethal poisons distributed by private individuals or by public officials, it is surely only because our forefathers, despite their considerable wisdom and foresight, could conceive of no such problem. I contend, furthermore, that we have allowed these chemicals to be used with little or no advanced investigation of their effects on soil, water, wildlife, and man himself. Future generations are unlikely to condone our lack of prudent concern for the integrity of the natural world that supports all life. There is still very limited awareness of the nature of the threat. This is an era of specialists, each of whom sees his own problem and is unaware of our intolerance of the larger frame into which it fits. It is also an era dominated by industry in which the right to make a dollar at whatever cost is seldom challenged. When the public protests confronted with some obvious evidence of damaging results of pesticide applications, it is fed little tranquilizing pills of half-truth. We urgently need an end to these false assurances, to the sugarcoating of unpalatable facts. It is the public that is being asked to assume the risks that the insect controllers calculate. The public must decide whether it wishes to continue on the present road and it can do so only when in full possession of the facts. In the words of Jean Rostand, the obligation to endure gives us the right to know.